Oh, hi, and welcome to my shop. Hey, it's a beautiful day outside in that some light, fluffy snow is falling, sticking to everything, so everything is snow covered. And it looks really good. I think it's a good day to see this record player work. Now, why would it work? Because I spent a couple hours last night working on this. No video, just me and here all by myself. And uh, let's see what happened. So, I'm going to give this a guy a go on uh, 45 first. Here we are, 45. Now, the record I'm going to play here is not a 45 record. It's, a, it's actually a 33 record. But it has the 45 size, the 7 inch size, with a small hole in the middle. So I grabbed it because it's a good demo demo uh, record. You can see the feeler arm here up against the side of the record. So this is identifying for the record player what size record this is so the tone arm will come over appropriately and either do a 12, a 10, or a 7 inch uh, record. Okay, let's give it a go here. Fantastic. So that's 45. You can't even see the platter slow down. It pushes its way right through the whole mechanism operation perfectly. Let's try another speed. Switch this to 45. I have to be careful now I don't knock off my cameras because for some reason this generates some kind of lightning bolt of some sort that knocks out my cameras regularly. Okay, so this is the appropriate speed for this record. Let's see if it can do it. Can you do it? Made it. So this record, uh, I guess this probably came into my possession when I was a kid. I don't really know where this came from. Or I bought it at a yard sale. That's probably what happened. I got it at a yard sale with a bunch of records. But it's actually uh, come from Nestle's Quick. <laughs> the Crocodile Song, The Fisherman and His Wife, Bambi, and The Laughing Giraffe. But I'm not going to listen to all those. I'm going to put on a 78 here. Okay, so we can try the 78 speed. You'll see this is a different size record now. It's a 10 inch record. 78 is the toughest one for this machine. Let's let her rip here. Tough in the sense that it has a hard time driving the mechanism. It, it's running, uh, its speed is running well and it can play a record uh, once the record's down and the needle's on it, but getting there is a little tough. Here we go. Come on, baby. Heave, 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 heave. Keep heaving. Come on, come on, you can do it. Come on, come on. Uh. Okay, a little helping hand there. Come on. Okay, another helping hand. Oh, wait a second. Hold on, hold on. False start. Wrong needle. Gotta use the 78 needle. It does make a difference. It is much better on 78. There we go again. Ooh, sounds a little slow, doesn't it? Hmm. 
Hmm. Speed's slow, but very, very consistent. Now, if I do the drag test on it. It's not too bad. I think it's speeding up a bit. You know, there's a lot of really cool music uh, on 78 records just waiting to be played. It's all so real, so wonderfully real. I've Oops, I activated the stop. Can it do it? Come on. No. So that's after a couple hours of effort uh, trying to solve the traction problems in here. So, I mean, the good news is, well, the good news is it'll play 45s and 33s. Unfortunately, 78 seems a little slow still. So enough for this, though. I'm going to go on and work on the uh, amplifier in the background there. I'm going to set this aside now and uh, carry on with some electronic stuff. Okay, so I've got some capacitors to change under here, uh, but before I do that, uh, I'm going to have a little bit of fun trying something I haven't tried before, and uh, I kind of want to find out the uh, um, frequency response or the output quality of this amplifier before I make a bunch of changes in it. So I'm going to try to sweep through the audio spectrum and uh, analyze that using some software to see what kind of frequency response occurs. And like I say, I've never done this before, so I'm out on the edge again. Chances are this isn't going to work, but let me give it a try. So first I've got my sweep generator set to sweep between, uh, let's see, 100, 100 kilohertz at the top. So I want it to stop around 30 kilohertz. I want it to start pretty much as low as it can and we'll just see what that amounts to. This is fed into the input over here. Uh, this input is then I'm pretty sure it's preamplified. Maybe not, you know, I may be wrong about that. In fact, I, I think I am wrong about that. I think the output is just fired along this cable over to the amplifier. Here's the preamplifier two output tubes and I have a speaker way up high here way up here, and a microphone. Now, I'm going to be doing this through the microphone, and yes, that's not really the right way to do this, of course, but uh, it's a pretty good microphone, and uh, from a comparison point of view, um, using the same stuff when you make a comparison should enable, you know, if there's a difference between the before and after, before I change the capacitors and after, should still be able to see that. Uh, but you know, really, I'm just on my way to having some fun here. <laughs> I think fun and okay. So let's get this going because we're going to hear it coming out of the speakers. So I don't even remember which of these is volume now because it's been four weeks since I've handled this guy. Four or five weeks maybe. So band tuning. I think this switches phono. You know, I can't remember now. I can remember. I can remember nothing. That just put. Hey, just more fun. More fun. So we'll switch this guy on. He's currently. Let's see. This may not help us too much at this frequency. Nine. Nine hertz, really? No, I don't think so. Well, it could be. It could be as low as nine hertz here. And the upper end, 38. Now, that's supposed to be 38 kilohertz. So it's 30 kilo. That makes more sense. So I'm going from nine. I don't, I don't want to go from nine kilohertz. I want to go down lower. I don't think I can get there. We're off to a bad start here. Nine kilohertz. Well, let's listen to it and see what it sounds like. I'll just leave it sitting on this frequency for now, so it's not sweeping. Turn this guy on. Now, he hasn't been on. 
hasn't been on for a while. He's just been sitting in storage waiting for another chance in here. Pretty sure I must have the volume turned down. Speaker connected. Here we go. Let's do it with restricted power first. Lights come on. One light. Other ones have turned out, I guess. Give it a little bit of time. Okie dokie. Turn it up a little bit. So there's the radio playing. Sounds like the AM radio. But what I want is the phonograph. So I think it's this switch. Uh, volume down. You know what? This volume control must work when the records are playing. There's no other volume control. So, so the signal must be going through some amplification in here. I just don't remember for that to work. Not enough coffee. I haven't got the strength to turn the knob. Far too big a tool here. And that's not doing it. Then it must be the band switch. This must be a tone thing. This must be the band switch that gets us there. Volume down. Make sure the output is minimal here. Yeah, there's three settings on that band switch. One of them. Well, that's pretty quiet. AM. This would be FM. Two of them, stone quiet. I have an FM antenna connected. I should be hearing a hiss or something. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Outside antenna. Well, hmm. I'm gonna have to watch back some of my old videos and remind myself where I am with this radio. So, wow, okay. Um, let's just try this again. Maybe it didn't. It's just stone silence. I'm expecting either a uh, roughly a 10,000 hertz tone or uh, FM. Okay, so what I gotta do is I gotta go out and look at the cabinet and see how this control uh, works again. Ah, oh, bad start. Another bad start. Okay, that's good. So, phono is turned all the way this way like it is now. That's phono. This is a scratch filter. I'd forgotten about that. It's just basically, I think, a specialized tone control. We don't hear a thing. Okay, let's up the signal here because just maybe this is so low. This frequency, if, it, if it's 9 hertz, if I've got this set wrong, then uh, I'm not going to hear that. Let's go up to the other end here. Not a thing. Nothing. Not a thing at all. So, hmm. Well, perhaps I didn't make the input connection right from here. try let's try this arrangement here I've got an adapter 
You'll be able to plug it right into the input on the amplifier. We should we should hear some of this stuff here. Not a sound. I need to expect hums and pops while I'm doing this. Something not right. Something not right. Something not right. Okay, it's definitely on phono. It's on phono no no. Yet it works on the radio. Nothing. Okay, I have a feeling something dumb is going on here. Okay, something dumb going on. I'm stumped. I'm, I'm not even. I'm still on the runway. Huh. Okay, now we just put a little more. There we go. Take a look at that. gets mixed in here while I'm doing this. Let's speed up the sweep here. Now, huh. so see, using software for this isn't the best thing. See how it's kind of undulating down through here? Take it down a chunk. Well, okay. Other than sounding pretty cool, that, that really didn't work. So it was a failed experiment. But you know, you got to try these things. So we can't really use software. There's far too much delay in the processing in the computer. So what we really need to try is hook it up on the scope. So I'm gonna I'm gonna set that up. I'm gonna set that up. Okay, so I got my scope ready here. Oh, <laughs> uh, call for insurance certificate. Yeah, I did that yesterday. That's where my reminder notes go. Okay, so we're going to want to hook up the scope in, uh, input coming from the speaker output here. I'm gonna tip this guy up. temporary speaker wires I put on while we're in the shop here. One is grounded to the chassis. That's that guy. Clip on to the other one here. I think we're going to get a lot better result out of this. Helps if I have the scope switched on. Set this to XY. Input here is what's causing the trace. The input here is coming from the sweep generator. And the, uh, the vertical is being driven from down here. Showing nothing at all right now. I can show nothing. We're listening to it. AC input. Oh, I turned it the wrong way here. The 
this is probably up too high. That's looking a little more interesting. Still too high. It should be on five, I think. So you can definitely see the change in frequency from down here up to here. And then the gain is just the, the width here. So you can see a roll off down in this area. It gets a little sloppy down here with a very low frequency. So let's we'll take it up to the higher end here. And you can definitely see it weakening as it goes. Now, you know, the thing is, you hear what's coming out of the speaker, and our ears don't, like, every, everything that's involved here has a characteristic curve, everything from my speaker, my ears, everything. So, again, this is more a comparative type deal. Let me just uh, fix the frequency here so it's not sweeping. Okay, I'm going to go up on the higher end. So this is this is 10 or 10 kick. It's not sweeping now, so you can't see this. But just listening with your ear, I do hear nothing. In fact, we can just do this. Get something sweeping there. So now I'm using the scope like an ordinary scope. Get a tiny, tiny uh, alternating current there. Probably can't see it in the camera. If I turn the volume up a bit. I can hear it. Hopefully it's being captured on the microphone. It's very high sound. So it's being reproduced. Now we'll, we'll take it, I'm going to turn the volume down. We'll take it down in frequency because it's going to get a little loud. Let me just close my shop blast door here. We'll take it down we'll watch what happens to the amplitude as we go down in frequency. How do I do that? Change. I gotta change. Make a change. Here we gotta change again. Okay, here we go. It's a little bit awkward. Well, you know what? I can go up and I'll go up like this. So take a look at the. I'm gonna get there, don't worry. <laughs> take a look at the amplitude here. It's one, two, three, you know, roughly four divisions. pretty weak up there and that's for sure. And we're at 10 kilohertz. I can hear it. I don't know if it's coming across on the video but it's quite weak. Uh, it would be lost if there was music playing that, that it would just be lost and I don't think you could ever hear that. So I can't really declare. Like it's just dropping off the whole time. There's no uh, you know steady amplitude to a certain frequency and then down it goes. It's just going down the whole time. Oops. So, uh, okay, that's about. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm proving there. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to change out. <laughs> excuse me. Down in the uh, amplifier, all these. Uh, molded capacitors. I'm going to change them all out, test them all. It's only a few. And then we'll retest the amplifier just as it is now and see what the result is. Okay, so here's the schematic for the amplifier. And the first capacitor I'm going to go after is this one here. This is a 0.01 and it's right across the uh, output transformer primary side here. So 
Well, that's our that's our target. So here's the uh, output transformer. There's the speaker terminals. I can see the leads going from here to the speaker terminals. Output transformer, primary side. Capacitor here, capacitor here. Uh, let's see. You can see the primary wires coming out of this transformer. And they are attached. You know what? This is the guy right here. He's the guy. Okay, power's off to this. Let's just make absolutely sure I don't do something dumb. Because once in a while I do. And, uh, cut this out. We'll leave the tails in. Well, it looks to be in really good shape. Offhand, I wonder if we should take a closer look at that. Yes, we should. As I find my camera, where's the camera? What, 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 what's on camera? It's a bunch of wires. Here it is, right here, right in front of me. <laughs> okay, how's it look? Now, often these are cracked. Looking right along the seam there. Let's just put a little more light on the action. See, I think the seam is open at the top there. Hard to say, isn't it? Very hard to say. Another, another place these guys. I don't know if that seam is cracked or not. Another place is right where the uh, leads come out. It's very, very hard to make that moisture tight, especially after you know you've worked with this capacitor, installing it, you're bending the leads a little bit. It's definitely hard to tell if that's actually cracked open or not. It doesn't look like it. it doesn't look like it. Let's uh, let's put them in the tester. Okay, so he's hooked up now. Give him a test at 25. A good capacitor, this aisle will snap closed and pop right open again, just like you see it. It takes a moment for the capacitor to charge up. That causes the eye to close, but once it charges, it's open. If there's a leakage, it just won't open all the way. If it's bad, it won't open at all. So here we go, 25 volts, not much voltage. Wow, okay, so that's testing like brand new. 150 volts. Oh. Yeah, there's no doubt that's connected. Wow, okay, it's among the very best capacitors I've ever tested. Here we go. That's 250 volts on this thing. Zero leakage. No clear sign of uh, damage or cracking. Okay, I'm just leaving it connected briefly so it can discharge. Not that this is going to hold much charge, but you got a good capacitor, it will hold the charge um, for, for quite a while. Well, these leads connected in this thing sitting here in the non-test mode, there's actually a short put on the capacitor. So just in case you're wondering if I'm going to handle a 250 volt capacitor, I, I don't plan on it. So what am I going to do now? I've taken out one capacitor, it looks good, tests perfect. Um, should I be doubtful about the rest of these? Hey, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what's that? 0 0.001. Uh, I thought I was taking out a 0 0.01. 0 0.001. Maybe it's a, it does look a little bit small for a 0 0.01 of this vintage. What did I do? What? <laughs> Once again, I'm asking that question, the eternal question, what the heck am I doing? 0 0.01. Well, what did I grab? Uh, 05. 05, 02. Where is there a point zero zero one in here? Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that this is the right position. I 
Now, I don't see any point zero zero uh, one capacitor in here. Blue and brown, those are the colors of the wires too. So this is definitely the capacitor. Okay, so on here it says point zero one, but what I actually took out, and I'm sure it's original, pretty sure it's original. Did somebody already change all these capacitors? And I'm already looking at a new set. An interesting question. And what should I do about this? Should I follow the, the book, put in a point oh one, or put in a point zero zero one? And what is this thing doing anyway? Frankly, I don't know. I don't know why there's a capacitor here, but very common there's a capacitor across the uh, across the winding. Don't know exactly why it's there. Well, we know this with the point zero zero one in there. The, uh, the set was operating. If I put a bigger capacitor, it's going to allow more signal through itself. How would that be some kind of advantage here? So I think I got to put a point. I got to put back in what was there already. I assume that perhaps they changed it in you know this is the early uh, the early design, and then down the road they made a change and decided this was too small. Or too big, rather, they put in a smaller one. Or it's a mistake made in the factory, that's not very likely at all. Not very likely at all. Well, how do I get myself into these corners all the time? It seems like everything I do is supposed to be very simple and straightforward. It turns into uh, a thousand curveballs being thrown at me. I think the only thing I can do is put in uh, put in exactly what was in there, 0.001. Why don't we take a close look at the rest of these before I get going here? And see if I can see any cracks in them or any other reason to want to bother changing any of these. These bigger ones might be more prone to cracking. It looks wonderful. seen a lot of this kind of capacitor, molded plastic capacitor, and they're so commonly cracked. But uh, I don't think these are cracked at all. Just the seam line for the shell. See, the thing is, these capacitors, if they've been in here since day one, they, they've proven their resilience. Maybe this is a uh, later version of the molded capacitor, and uh, the uh, problems with them have been overcome, perhaps. I think the only thing I can do, even though they all look good, is change them all anyway. I know for sure what I'm putting in is going to be good, uh, you know, basically, till I'm no longer on the planet. And same thing for the owner of this, too. He won't be on the planet when the capacitors fail. So I think I think that's what i got to do. I don't think I can stop at this point. So I'm just going to wholesale change them at, at this point. There's not many, just a few. And uh, we'll check out the amplifier, see what it does after.
a little bit surprising. This is the Sunday edition in your radio across Canada on CBC Radio 1 and across North America on Sirius XM Radio. My name is Michael Lennon. It is one of the line items in municipal budgets that cash-strapped councils often train their sites on. Public libraries. You can't cut police, firefighters, garbage collection, or any number of other essential services, but public libraries all too often seem non-essential. Surely the reasoning seems to be in this age when every scrap of information you could possibly want is available on the internet, public libraries are expensive and expendable. But as municipal politicians repeatedly find out the hard way, you mess with libraries, librarians, and their supporters at your peril. The late Toronto Mayor Rob Ford and his brother Doug stirred up a hornet's nest and came out on the wrong end of verbal sparring with Margaret Atwood, no less, with their intent to impose major budget cuts on public libraries. More recently, Newfoundland and Labrador's Liberal government backed off its plan to close 54 rural libraries in the name of budget austerity after the public outcry that ensued. It's true that the role of public libraries is changing in the Internet age, but it could be argued they are more indispensable than ever. In a time when information is power, as never before, we still need guides to help navigate the bewildering sprawl of available information and institutions that safeguard access to that information. In the world according to John Pateman, the modern day library should be much greater than the sum of its collection and the information that it holds. He has been working in public libraries for almost four decades in various capacities, both in the UK and Canada. Currently, he is CEO and Chief Librarian of the Thunder Bay Public Library. That's his official title. Unofficially, he is an unabashed revolutionary. And John Bateman joins me this morning from CBC's Thunder Bay studio. Hello, welcome to the Sunday edition. Hello, good, good morning. What is it that many politicians do not get about public libraries? I think fundamentally, public libraries are, are part of the DNA of communities. Communities get public libraries, even if they don't use them. Uh, obviously, we want more people to use them all the time, but even people who've never stepped foot inside a public library have got some kind of connection with it, some kind of warmth towards it, some kind of uh, story to share. Maybe one, one of their family members used it. So I missed one entirely. There's a kind of emotional attachment to public libraries, which is a strength, for sure. Uh, but also can be a weakness because that can stop libraries from changing, uh, from evolving and from keeping up with the times. And my mission is to make sure that libraries remain relevant to community needs. And, mi and municipal politicians don't understand that? Is that what it is? Or they see it as a, well, I hate the word, but see it as a frill of some kind? Well, I don't want to stereotype uh, all uh, local politicians, but some of them, maybe many of them, remember the library from their own childhood. They've got some kind of uh, warm childhood glow about the dusty shelves and the Shushin librarian. And the Dewey uh, Decimal System. And the Dewey Decimal System and the, uh, and, um, the inspection of the fingernails before they could borrow the children's books. And the myriad rules and regulations that drive me crazy, um, but they don't understand that public libraries are much more than just books on shelves, that they are an essential community service, that they are really the glue that sticks the community together. How do you know that? Unfortunately, I can demonstrate that through my own experience in the UK of what happens when a public library closes. And what we found in the UK after uh, library closures is that things like health indices get worse, um, education metrics go down, crimes go up. The, the kind of community falls apart, uh, partly because that, that vital free community resource has been removed. Is this what you refer to as a community hub? Is that the idea? Well, I think the, the rebranding, the, the repositioning of libraries as community hubs is a useful thing because the library uh, brand is very strong. Everybody knows what a library is. But also, again, it can very much limit the perception of libraries, which is, in my view, much more than books. Ultimately, we're a place where people come together, get to understand each other, and have their needs met. And that may well include a fine collection of books, but it will also include a business incubation centre, such as we have here at Waverley Library, a makerspace, a northern nature trading service, a youth hub, you know, any number of things that are focused on meeting community needs. What is a 
Centre, is it? A business incubation centre, quite simply, is where people can go who are currently trying to grow their businesses in their basements uh, or their hey, spare rooms. Me. They can come into the library, they can use all the facilities that we have there, and when they feel able to, they can leave the library nest and launch themselves as fully French businesses. But you're faced with a conundrum, or several conundra, in that the people who need public libraries the Conundra. most were the ones who used the least, at least according to a survey in 2000. Yes, and I was part of the research that unearthed that startling finding. It was called Open to All, question mark, the public library and social exclusion. Right. And we did indeed find that people who need us the most use us the least. So reversing that paradigm is the challenge that we face. Now, right, let's take social exclusion and poverty. How do you see the role or the responsibility of public libraries toward the poor? I think uh, public libraries were instituted certainly in the UK in the mid 19th century to Let's check help a couple of resistors the here. Deserving poor. And there's a big debate around the undeserving poor as well. But I think they were instituted initially to give access and opportunity to people who weren't red, in formal education, orange. who didn't have the ability no. red, to red, orange. Have books like at home, access to K. automation, etc. So there's always been that historical imperative that public libraries should be pro poor. But over time, that's kind of worn away, it's been eroded, uh, and the view today tends to be more that we should be neutral, that we shouldn't be pro anybody, we should Ooh. be kind of for everybody, which would be great if you had limited resources, but within the resources we've got, I think we should go back to our historical mission and target those that are the greatest needs, which ha often happens to be people in poverty and who don't have access to services, jobs, etc. That's people are poor 220, I think. So what, how does the library ameliorate that, that particular situation. Well, money uh, attracts money, as, as you Oops. know. The more money you've got, the more opportunities, the more choices you have. So right. if we can provide... 226. Free, no problem with that. For. Okay, everything looks good. Of course, we're going to start it up on restricted power, though. By the way, I uh, quickly leaked, checked all these removed capacitors. They all test perfectly good. So I, I really think... You know, in the short term, no difference. 30 years from now, maybe having these capacitors is going to be better than having these. But I wouldn't even bet on that. I wouldn't bet on that. If if they've made if a capacitor has made it this far, it still works fine. It's probably going to go, you know, twice as far again. And that's how I base my own life. I've made it this far. I'm in pretty good shape. I'm on my way to being 130. That's my calculation. Okay, plug her in. The power is off. Oh, a bit of a blast there from the camera. Okay, so what am I doing here? I still have the feed from the sweep generator feeding in. I've left it all on. Don't think I touched anything. That's more famous last words. Okay, on goes the power. The dim bulbs have remained dim. Everything looks fine. Let's go full power. Put on my eye protection here, <laughs> just in case. Hey, what's that I hear? There we go. Can you hear it? It's really high now. I have no idea if you can hear that kind of thing. That's 20 kilohertz there. Let's give it just a wee bit more input. You know, it's a question, can my speaker reproduce 20 kilohertz? Can my ears hear 20 kilohertz? I think my microphone pick up 20 kilohertz. I think it's no, no, no. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm just trying to find the upper limit of what I can hear. Well, I'd say it's in around 14. I can barely hear something 14, 15 megahertz. Clearly I can hear it though. Well, 
no question at 10. Let's see, did I leave the scope all connected exactly as it was? Sweep on. I think I was doing it by hand before, wasn't I? Yeah, let me do that. Sweep off. Yeah, that's what I was doing. Okay, so we'll just look at the amplitude of this signal. Take it down in frequency here. Well, can't go down much lower than that. Going up from here. Okay, it's just rolling off. like that's what a full output is or bring it up almost no roll off in that range we're at two kilohertz at the top here let's go up three four five six seven eight nine ten Well, it certainly isn't any worse. How low can we go? Ooh, sounds a little Star Trekish, doesn't it? Okay, so we can see that. I certainly can't hear it. Let me. So that's where those Star Trek sounds came from. One of these things. So we're at, oh my gosh, I don't know what we're at now, I can't, I can't figure out my own instruments. Really low. That's reproducing it all the way down. Bottom end is great. Okay. Well, I think what that says is changing those capacitors may be a small benefit, certainly no harm. Uh, certainly extending the life of this unit. Uh, I, I think, anyway. I think these are certainly going to last a lot longer than these guys. Both of which are going to last a lot longer than me. So, I think that's I think that's okay. I think we're done there with that. Next thing is, oh my god, back to radio tuning over here. That's, <laughs> that's what will be happening on the next video. Hey, thanks a lot for watching, and uh, see you soon.